The stages of labor is one of the biggest bread and butter topics that you'll encounter both during an OB block during your first and second years of medical school and on the labor and delivery floors on your OB rotations. While I will say that a lot of it is memory work, this video will at least give you another medium by which to remember the information that's different from reading it in a book. Let's start from the beginning. The stages of labor are the progression of the delivery of a baby starting from the beginning of cervical dilation to the actual delivery. There are three stages of labor. Now I found for me that the easiest way to remember this is to get a general sense of what happens in each stage and then plug in the more specific numbers after. What gets confusing is there's numbers for both nulliparous and multiparous patients. So if you feel like you're not able to memorize any more numbers than you already have to, I would just suggest knowing the nulliparous patient numbers and assume that a multiparous patient does everything 40% shorter. Board questions also are more likely to ask you whether the time to progression from one stage to the next is prolonged rather than what the specific numbers are. So just having a general sense is usually okay. Finally, if you have the chance to shadow at a birthing pavilion for a day, it will really help you memorize this much better, but not necessary since I didn't do that either. So the first stage of labor is the onset of labor to dilation and effacement of the cervix. Now, I, I'm going to mention cervical dilation a lot, and basically this just means the cervix changing from long and thick to short and thin. Now, what we really measure is how big the cervical oz is. So in the earlier stages of stage one, it's very small, starting off with zero centimeters, and later on, fully effaced and dilated is 10 centimeters. So this first stage happens in two parts, the latent and the active phase, which are divided by how far the cervix has dilated. So the latent phase is from zero centimeters until about four centimeters. You can just remember five to make it easier. And the second part is from the four or five centimeters to 10 centimeters. And as the names imply, there are two phases because the latent one is significantly slower than the active one. You may also see numbers of cervical change in terms of centimeters per hour, which really is another way of memorizing how long this phase should be. But in my opinion, it's less high yield, as we like to say in medical school. Now remember this stage as the rate limiting step. It's what really keeps moms in the hospital for the longest period of time. As far as timing is concerned, this stage lasts 10 to 12 hours in a nulliparous patient and 6 to 8 in a multiparous patient. However, these are averages, but you can see what I mean. Now, one other thing I just want to throw in is the three Ps. Power, passenger, and pelvis. These are more or less self-explanatory and you've probably heard them in medical school ad nauseum, but they basically tell you whether you will have a vaginal delivery. So can the mom provide enough power to push the baby? Can the baby come through, or is it too large for the pelvis? And finally, is the pelvis too small to have a baby come through? Now going on to the second stage. The goal of this stage is to del deliver the infant. This is where timing is a little bit more important since at this point you can roughly calculate how much longer it will be until the baby is delivered. You need to remember the number two, two for stage two. This stage is considered prolonged if it's longer than two hours in a nulliparous patient. You might see the number go up to three if the patient has had an epidural. Again, remembering our 40% less rule for multiparous patients, here, the stage is considered prolonged if it's longer than one hour with no epidural and two hours with an epidural. Finally, the last stage. The goal of this stage is to deliver the placenta. So again, the stage starts with the infant being delivered and ends with the placental delivery. The number to remember in this portion is 30 minutes, which is the upper limit of this stage. However, most of the time, the separation of the placenta occurs within five to 10 minutes. This is where you might see oxytocin used to strengthen contractions. 
as well as the ob giving suprapubic pressure to prevent uterine inversion. One of the questions I guarantee you'll be asked are the three signs of placental separation. These are cord lengthening, a gush of blood, sorry for the graphic drawing, and feeling that the uterine clamps down, i.e. it becomes more of a globular shape than a discoid shape. Now there is reason for why you want to know this. You don't want to pull the placenta away from the uterus too early because it will bleed and you may end up with a uterine inversion, which means panic and possibly a trip to the OR. So you best make sure to look for these signs during the third stage. Okay, fine. Perhaps I was also asked this question at 3 a.m. on my first night of call ever and looked at the resident like, are you joking me? I have no clue. <laughs> Since then, I've learned. Now take home points. There are three stages of labor which start from cervical dilation and end with the delivery of the placenta. Stage 1, start of labor to complete cervical dilation. Stage 2, complete cervical dilation to delivery of baby. Stage 3, delivery of baby to delivery of placenta. Approximate times for a nulliparous patient is stage 1, 10 to 12 hours, stage 2, 2 to 3 hours, stage 3, 5 to 30 minutes. And finally, the three signs of placental separation are cord lengthening, gush of blood, and change in uterine shape from flat, discoid, to round and globular. Thank you.